Greetings comrades! So in my previous video I've made my stance on labor camps pretty clear. And I think you've heard that stance hundred times before from western media too. That the Gulag was horrible, inhumane and generally was a crime against the people of the Soviet Union. And I want to make it clear once again that I fully support this point of view. You just can't justify what was happening in those camps. Keep that in mind before watching this video. Because today I am going to try on the role of the devil's advocate. I will try to explain why the Soviet Union needed the Gulags. And we will see if they were economically beneficial for the development of the country at that time. You know, there are two very popular myths among those who consider Stalin's rule to be one of the best times in the country's history. The first myth is that in fact the scale of repressions is greatly exaggerated by modern historians and that only those who deserved it, the real enemies of the people, were put to the labor camps. The second popular belief is that the Gulag system was essential for the industrialization of the country and for the economy of the USSR as a whole that without this system in place it would be impossible to raise the country from its knees so quickly in such a short period of time. Today we will look at the arguments of the supporters of this second point of view and discuss why this system was introduced in the USSR, whether it was very different from the Tsarist Katarga system, did it really help the Soviet Union to become a truly great superpower and, in general, can it even be justified in any way? Toward the end of its existence, the Russian Empire managed to transform its penitentiary system by abolishing exile settlements and Katarga labor. With the revolution of 1917 and the subsequent civil war came the concentration labor camps, in which the Bolsheviks placed class enemies of the new regime and simply socially or politically undesirable people. In fact, this is what distinguished the Soviet labor camps from the Tsarist hard labor colonies. Only those guilty of particularly grave crimes were sent to the Katarga. Others could be exiled to Siberia, true, but they were not forced to work there. In Soviet times, however, the labor camps housed not dangerous criminals only, but all kinds of criminals. In fact, from the beginning, right after the revolution, they were not even prisons, but temporary detention centers, which were set up in some weird places. For example, in monasteries. The basic principles of these places were self-sufficiency and the complete re-education of prisoners. A key year in the history of the labor camps was 1929, the year of the so-called Great Break, when a decision was made to finally stop the NAP and proceed along the lines of collectivization, decolocization and forced industrialization. On July 11, 1929, the Council of People's Commissars of the USSR issued a resolution on the use of labor convicts, under which the formation of a network of correctional labor camps, later named the Gulag, began. The Gulag's first major project was the construction of the White Sea Baltic Canal, which began in the second half of the 1930s. The head of the construction project was Naftali Aronovich Frenkel, to whom the very idea of using cheap labor force of prisoners to work at large construction sites is often attributed. Of course, he was an expert in that field, because he himself spent several years in the Salavki, the first and until 1929 the only official correctional labor camp in the Soviet Union. During the construction of the canal, the camp economy demonstrated its advantages for the first time. The forceful and rapid accumulation of large labor groups of up to 100,000 people and their ruthless exploitation resulted in the fact that the canal was built in only two years. It was after this project that the Soviet leadership saw the Gulag system as an invaluable asset. Now the main task of the prisoners was to develop the unhabitated territories, which contained useful resources – timber, coal, gold and so on. The inmates not only had to work, but literally had to build settlements from scratch for themselves and their guards, redeeming themselves for their crimes in the process. He had self-sufficiency and re-education through hard work. Perfect. It was supposed also to be more cost-effective than sending ordinary Soviet citizens to work there. Let's take a look at the effectiveness of this system. <laughs> 
what were the advantages of using prison labor? Oh, believe me, they were more than enough. The forced labor economy performed several functions that were impossible or almost impossible to achieve using normal methods of stimulation of labor activity. First, it ensured the development of those remote, hard-to-reach regions characterized by extremely unfavorable climatic conditions and a lack of basic infrastructure, where involvement of ordinary workers would require significant investments. Even if a person believed with all his heart in the bright future of communism, trust me, it was quite difficult to convince him to volunteer to go to the deep taiga and build Narilsk. Secondly, this system provided an extremely mobile workforce, easily moved from site to site depending on the needs of the state. Today you build a hydroelectric power plant on Volga, tomorrow you build a village near an oil field in Uhta, and the day after tomorrow you build a railroad in Selihard. Well, if you manage to survive. Thirdly, this labor force could be exploited almost without restrictions, until it was completely exhausted. Fourth reason was that the threat of ending up in the Gulag disciplined the free workers of the Soviet Union too. We should not forget this, in fact, the mere existence of such a system in the country increased productivity in other areas as well. Yes, it's brutal, but it's effective. Finally, the existence of a significant layer of prisoners reduced the pressure on the meager consumer market and made it easier to solve acute social problems, such as housing, for example. Not enough housing in the country? Oh, we'll give you housing. You'll also build it yourself. Yes, right there, in Kalima. I know it may sound like I'm trolling, but there is some logic to it. Twisted logic, but still. In addition, it is worth noting that industrialization is a gigantic and complex process. Thousands of large enterprises are being built. Where do we get the necessary equipment for them? The machinery? So, Soviet Union had to sell its products to the West and buy equipment, machine tools and sometimes even entire factories. What could we offer the world at that time? Bread, timber, gold, natural resources. There were problems with bread in the 1930s, but for everything else, there was the Gulag. From the second half of the 1930s, the Gulag mined 100% of the gold of the USSR, mostly in the difficult conditions of the Magadan mines. Without the Gulag, there would have been no gold, no exports, no machines bought, no rapid industrialization. Or the Norilsk mining and metallurgical combine. The plant which almost single-handedly covered the needs of the country in the extraction of non-ferrous metals. A huge enterprise in the far north, beyond the Arctic Circle. About 100,000 Norilak prisoners worked at its construction. If there were no camp, there would be no enterprise either, and no city itself. Was it possible to somehow solve this problem without actually involving forced labor? Probably it is possible, after all people work in Narilsk today and are getting paid for it. Was it possible within the framework of the system that existed in the USSR? Probably not. Even before the construction of the White Sea Baltic Canal was finished, it was decided to use the labor of the prisoners on the construction of the Moskva Volga Canal, Baikal Amur Main Line, on the development of oil and coal fields of Pechora Basin, for the boosting of gold mining in Kalama for the infrastructural development of the Far East and Central Asia. During the Second World War, the Gulag concentrated its powers on the construction of metallurgical plants and airfields, the production of military uniforms and ammunition. Afterwards, it took leading positions in railroad and hydraulic engineering construction, in timber harvesting, as well as in the gold, platinum and asbestos industries, in diamond and apatite mining, in tin and nickel production, in the construction of oil refineries and nuclear project facilities. Without the Gulag, the USSR would not have achieved such impressive results. Even Sergei Korolev was once a convict and spent several years in various prison camps and closed research institutes, developing bombers and rocket engines. Who knows? Maybe without this experience, the father of Soviet cosmonautics would not have become a man he eventually became. So I have given you many arguments for the fact that the Gulag camp system in the Soviet Union worked and was somewhat effective. So why did they decide to abandon it in the 1950s? Was it only because of the humanism of the country's leadership after Stalin's death? No, not really. 
Back in the early 50s, Deputy Minister of Internal Affairs Vasily Chernyshov has acknowledged in his reports to Stalin. Detention of prisoners in camps was very expensive and in many cases unprofitable for production and construction. A memo from Minister Kruglov in October 1950 addressed to Lavrenti Beria stated that the upkeep of one prisoner during the construction of Volga Don Canal cost 470 rubles per month, while his salary, the salary of the minister, was about 390 rubles. In 1955, the excess of expenses for the maintenance of the camps over the revenues amounted to 860 million rubles. At the same time, the Gulag provided less than 2.5% of the total industrial output of the USSR. And this decline happened not in the 50s when conditions in the camps became noticeably milder, but during the Great Terror too. But back then the problem was a surplus of prisoners, so to speak. USSR had to draw resources to transporting prisoners, urgently building new camps, organizing management, guards and supervision, providing prisoners with clothing, shoes, food and so on. The Gulag system was simply not ready for that many new arrivals. And that, let me remind you, taking into account the record number of death penalties pronounced in 1937-1939, when about 700,000 people were shot during a year and a half. Let me remind you that in those years the industrialization was in full swing and they seemed to need workers. Why did the NKVD shut 700,000 people who could help the country and build a dozen of new hydroelectric power stations, several factories and some railways? Perhaps it was because the camp system was simply not ready to accept so many new prisoners. As horrible as that may sound. There were also problems with productivity for another, more obvious reason. No matter how brutal the enforcement, the productivity of slave labor would always be low. As early as in 1939, Gosbank concluded that the efficiency of construction and installation work at Gulag construction sites was almost four times lower than at the average sites of the People's Commissariat for Construction. The camp economy was based on hard, physical labor, with a minimum of machinery used. What kind of efficiency could we talk about there? We must not forget that in conditions where such labor was practically an inexhaustible resource, the Soviet leadership began to use it not always effectively. On March 5th, 1953, Stalin died. A couple of weeks later, Beria, then Soviet interior minister, halted the construction of dozens of major Gulag facilities, including a number of railroads that turned out to be unneeded or a tunnel between the mainland and Sakhalin. Just look at the abandoned Chum Selikhart Igarka Railroad. In fact, gigantic amount of money was just thrown away. The last factor of inefficiency was corruption, of course. Do not think that it did not exist under Stalin. There has always been corruption in Russia, even in the Gulags. The annual damage from embezzlement was tens of millions of rubles. In general, this is what the Gulag was for the Soviet Union. Yes, the use of this system allowed the USSR to build projects fantastic in their scale, which in other conditions could hardly be created. However, was there a need to build some of these facilities at all? Formally, the cost of construction and operation of such facilities increased the overall performance of economic development of the country. But some may argue that they actually hindered the real industrialization, for which the USSR had to pay already after the collapse of the Gulag. On the other hand, imagine the Soviet Union in the 30s. Where would Comrade Stalin have found 100,000 free laborers ready to build the dam on the Rybinsk Reservoir or the White Sea Baltic Canal? There simply weren't any. Therefore, we cannot speak of the effectiveness of the Gulag based only on the comparison of the cost of maintaining the prisoners and the average wage of a Soviet worker. We should simply admit that if this system had not existed, we would not have seen the Soviet Union as it was. Terrible, yes, but great. Whether that would be good or bad is up to you to decide.